name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, today we have one of those hard-to-understand gospel readings from John. To me, sometimes reading John is like reading Dr. Seuss. He's all over the place, goes back and forth. And today, also the lectionary has given us a reading which really is the middle of a conversation. So to understand today's gospel a little bit better, I'm going to go to the beginning of the conversation, which is not found in our gospel today, but I'll read it. And these verses tell us how Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, but not just a Pharisee, he was also a member of the Sanhedrin, which is their Jewish religious and civil court. They were responsible for making sure the Jewish people followed all 600 plus laws that they had to do. So one night, Nicodemus comes to seek out Jesus because he's been following Jesus. He's been seeing Jesus, and he feels that Jesus is special. There's something more to him than just being a rabbi. So he goes out under the cover of darkness so the other Pharisees in the Sanhedrin do not know that he's going out to talk to him. And he opens up his conversation with a statement that he knew that Jesus was a teacher that came from God because of all the wondrous signs that Jesus was performing. So here we see the Nicodemus approach and his words to Jesus are polite and very reverent. And here's Jesus' response to that statement. He says, unless one is born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. Sure, Nicodemus is sitting there going, what? I mean, I just gave you this statement, you're telling me this. But what Jesus was saying to this nighttime visitor, Nicodemus, was that there was no time to waste. If he was really seeking out the kingdom of God, then he must make a new start. He must be reborn, born again from above. But Nicodemus did not understand what Jesus was saying. He was thinking, literally, a rebirth. So he asked him a couple of really good questions. He says, I'm an old man. How can I possibly be born again? How can I enter my mother's womb a second time? Well, then Jesus explains to Nicodemus what he meant by his statement that you have to be born again. But his explanation is just as puzzling as the original statement. Because here's what he said to Nicodemus. Flesh is born from flesh, but the spirit is born from spirit. So don't be surprised that I said to you that you must be born from above. The wind blows where it wants to, and you hear its sound, but don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So that's what it's like with someone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus is still puzzled. He's probably like, what? How can this be so? Beloved of God, Jesus' parables conceal as much as they reveal, and today his words to Nicodemus do the same. So it's not surprising that Nicodemus is still not understanding what Jesus is saying. And Jesus is kind of astonished at this because Nicodemus, after all, is a Pharisee, an expert on the Torah. And he doesn't understand how he doesn't grasp that a person must have a physical birth and a spiritual birth. So then he says to Nicodemus, if I told you earthly things, you don't believe. So how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And then it is this last comment by Jesus to Nicodemus. He who came down from heaven must be lifted up. That leads directly into our text this morning that we heard read. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. If, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, if that sounds a little familiar to you, it's because we heard it in our first reading this morning from Numbers. And here, Jesus is reminding Nicodemus of that time when Moses was leading the people to the promised land, and they began to complain about everything. And God sent the poisonous serpents to bite them. But he gave them a way out. When Moses put the bronze serpent on the pole, if they just looked up to the pole, they would be saved. And here, Jesus is clearly making this story in Numbers about the serpents, a parable of his own death on the cross. 
Because as Moses fixed the image of the serpent on the staff, and you all remember that a serpent is actually a symbol of healing. Have you ever seen the medical symbol? It's a pole with a snake wrapped around it. So he says, so Jesus would be fixed upon that cross, and he would die to heal and restore our relationship back to God. Both the lifted up serpent and the lifted up Jesus give new life to those who look upon them. So the parallels between these two stories have some similarities. In both stories, the people were in danger of death because of their sin. In both stories, God provides the agent for their salvation. The bronze serpent in the first story, Jesus in our gospel. And the agent of salvation is lifted up in both stories. And people are saved by looking and believing at that agent of salvation. But there's one difference. In the first story, our Old Testament reading, the bronze snake was only a piece of bronze. It had no saving power in itself. Years later, the Israelites began to kind of worship and give offerings to this same serpent. So the king Hezekiah had it destroyed. As their conversation continues in this night, Jesus offers Nicodemus and us now the greatest gift that we could ever receive with these words, which we all know as John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that whoever believes in him will not die, but will live forever or have eternal life. All his life, Nicodemus has perceived God to be a harsh judge, a demanding taskmaster who must be appeased with animal sacrifices, perfect obedience, and rules, rules, and more rules. But in this late night conversation with Jesus, God is described differently, one who loves, forgives, and welcomes sinners home. Martin Luther once said, how could God love such a world? If I were God, and these vile people were disobedient as they are, I would knock the world to pieces. But the miracle is he doesn't. Instead, he sends his son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Luther calls John 3.16 the gospel in miniature. God's motive is to love. God's motive is to offer salvation. John 3.16 is probably one of the best known, if not the best known, of all verses that come out of the Bible, especially in the New Testament. No single verse of Scripture may be as familiar in our world and in our churches as John 3.16. Even today, in a world which has biblical illiteracy, where people are not reading their Bibles like they used to, a lot of them aren't even attending church. Even if you say John 3.16, a lot of them will kind of recognize what that is. I remember back in the 70s and 80s, there was a guy with a multicolored wig who would show up at Super Bowl's World Series, and he was always holding up the sign, John 3.16. And the conversation with Nicodemus continues with him telling Nicodemus, Indeed, God did not send the Son to the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So Jesus' primary motivation was not to come to condemn us, but to save us. And he continues talking to Nicodemus. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Beloved of God, our human history is full of examples of people throughout history who have done evil things and loved the darkness. Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, I could go on and on. But Jesus is the light of the world. And the light has come into the world 
to expose our very need for God. And then the conversation continues. This is a long conversation, which is why I put the whole thing in there so that today would make more sense. Now Jesus indicates to Nicodemus that most people will try to find darkness, to hide away from God, because they fear the light. Because when we step into the light, into a relationship with Jesus, we have our deeds, motives, and actions exposed. And our need for salvation will be clear and visible. And sadly, many would rather hide in that darkness than seek out the light. The light exposes our sins, yet the light is the thing that we need to be healed and restored back to God. As followers of Jesus, we should never fear the light. We should rather just hate the darkness because the darkness allows us to hide away our sins. There's freedom and forgiveness in going into Jesus and experiencing fellowship with him because he came to seek out the lost. God loves the world and sent his son as a way for us to be reconciled back to him. So do not hide in the darkness, but instead always seek out the light so you can experience forgiveness and freedom from all your sins. If you don't get anything else from John's confusing gospel today, be sure you get this one thing. God loves, God gave, we believe, we have life. Beloved of God, I don't think it's any accident that this year Lent began on Valentine's Day, which the day we celebrate love. And this is how God so loved the world that he gave us Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I ask you to open our hearts to receive your perfect love. Forgive us for believing the enemy's lies and for the times that we've willingly turned away from you. Lord, you are the only source of love in this world because you are love. Thank you for your gift of Jesus, your son, our atoning sacrifice, which washes away our sins with his blood and reconciles us back to you. Help me today and every day to come to you and receive your unconditional love in our life. Soften our hearts and teach us to believe and receive your tender love. In Jesus' name, amen.